Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the program, I'll be joined by musical megastar Annie Lennox and by the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Not, of course, in the same interview, those two. But first, Britain's new and unfamiliar, in this country, coalition government. It's the UK's first coalition government for 70 years. The partners of the right of centre Conservative Party, which won 306 seats, and the centre-left Liberal Democrats, which won 57. But the two leaders, who used to be dedicated political opponents, have not been ushered into an ill-tempered partnership. Far from it. They seem delighted by the coalition agreement, and the new Prime Minister, David Cameron, describes it as a historic and seismic shift in British politics. And the two coalition partners certainly seemed in good mood, humorous mood, when they held their first joint press conference. Prime Minister, do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied, Nick Clegg? And Deputy Prime Minister, what do you think of that? <laughs> I, we're all going to have... I, I'm afraid I did oh, once. Right. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, we're all... Come back! We're all going to have um, things that we said um, thrown back at us. And, and, you know, there's a serious point in this, which is if you want to spend the next five years finding Lib Dem politicians who slightly disagree with Conservative politicians about this or a slightly nuanced policy, you can find lots. But we're looking at the bigger picture. We're looking at what a bold move like this with a strong, stable government can achieve. A warm mood there. Can it last? I'm joined now by Baroness Shirley Williams, formerly a cabinet minister with the Labour Party, now an elder stateswoman with the Liberal Democrats, tipped over the years to be our first woman prime minister, and two, she's Long been, time ago. <laughs> it's been at the forefront for, for years. Um, and in terms of this, you really advised, um, in the comment that was printed in The Guardian last weekend, you advised Nick Clegg not to do what he's done now uh, and form a full-blooded coalition. That is correct, um, but there are two things I didn't know when I wrote the article, though I still have considerable uh, questions in my mind about the coalition, though I think it is a very new approach. Uh, the first one was that I was unaware how much the Conservatives were prepared to concede. It has been quite amazing, actually. They've bought into maybe two-thirds of the Liberal Democrat proposals and objectives for government particularly on the issue of a sweeping political reform, ranging all the way from the democratic election of the House of Lords, the upper house, uh, through to fixed-term parliaments, which has already been announced, uh, through to massive changes in the way the House of Commons is run. Now, that one is music to the ears of Liberal Democrats. The difficult areas are in other parts. They are how we will uh, finance the deficit, how far that will fall on the better off and the, uh, and the less well off, on Europe, where there are broad, very broad differences, quite difficult differences to control. But I think probably for the next few months, the sheer excitement of being in government and the determination of both men to move politics on by a generation, that's a crucial thing to notice, uh, will carry them on uh, in fairly happy uh, relationship with one another. Yes, it, two men is right you're mentioning there, because in that brief clip, it, the body language, which is not something people can usually fake, mm. it's genuine usually, the body language was right, wasn't it, between the two Enthusiastic. Of them? I mean, they, they, I will say for both of them, they have both, in a sense, tried to reform their own parties, particularly the Cameron. Cameron's tried to pull the whole Conservative Party after him to a new and less partisan kind of politics, less Thatcherite, if you like. Um, I think he's going to find it difficult. The great strains, in my view, uh, between the, will not be between the leaders, they'll be between the leaders and their followers, and that's particularly true of the Conservative Party. So that looking ahead, do you think, how do you define the word succeed, but I mean, do you think this unusual wedding can succeed? It will succeed, I think, in the short term. That is to say, I think they will tackle the deficit. I think we'll see dramatic attempts to do that. I think they will bring in par parliamentary reform, which will actually change the way in which the Commons House of Commons works uh, and be quite dramatic. I think the difficulties will arise after those two crises have been tackled, and they are the great crises at the moment. They will arise after that because certainly on things like Europe and on some aspects of foreign policy, uh, there'll be considerable strains between them. It won't be easy to cobble together a common view. That's an interesting phrase you mentioned there of foreign policy because we haven't read much about that this week. What are the areas in foreign policy that they will have to 
The most significant twin is, themselves right. On the most significant Europe, is Europe. I mean, because the Lib Dems have always been a pro-European, pro-European Union party, um, the Conservatives have been uh, increasingly sceptical. And as you know, the leader of the Conservative Party in the European Parliament uh, actually resigned because of the position his own party was taking. He resigned in the European interest, so to speak. I think what we will see is um, what we've seen as the agreement so far is simply we won't do anything. We won't get closer so as not to offend the Liberal and uh, the Conservatives. We won't get further away, so as not to offend the Liberal Democrats. That's stasis, that's standing still. The European Union, meanwhile, will move on. And as you know, David, because we were speaking about that earlier, in the Eurozone, we're likely to see an attempt to try to bring budgets together to get cooperation on budgets and to impose pretty strict discipline on the Southern European members of the Eurozone. Britain will be outside all of that. But she can't stay outside forever because this is her major trading area. Mm. And so that's where I think there will be quite considerable strains. But in the short term and the medium term, you have a modest degree of optimism. In the short term, particularly, yes. Cause I, think, I think both parties and both men are committed to what they see as being the national interest. And they realize that means pretty dramatic steps to cut down on Britain's debt. Shirley, thank you so much. Thank you very much, David. Well, our thanks to Shirley Williams. Now, so much for what this means for Britain. What of its impact on the world stage? By the wonders of television, with me now is Douglas Hurd, a masterful former British Conservative Foreign Secretary, and Christopher Mayer, a masterful former UK Ambassador to the United States during Tony Blair's Labour government. Let me Blair. start with you, Douglas. I mean, are you pleased about the way this has all transpired. I mean, uh, Shirley Williams was yes in some ways and not so sure in others, but I mean, basically, you are you pleased with what's transpired? I'm, I'm delighted, and I think it's come as a great uh, refreshment to people who are bored with the ordinary kind of uh, politics as s shown in uh, Prime Minister's questions every week. Um, th this is something new. These are two youngish people, youngish people, um, neither of whom carry any responsibility for the mess we're in, who are clearly determined, and I think this is genuine, to do their best to, to sort it out. And, and, and it's just very refreshing to see them in action. Now, Shirley was quite right. They're going to be, they're going to be fisticuffs uh, before bedtime. Um, uh, but, but, but at the moment, it's, it's made a good start. And in fact, you think the, the world will find changes in the British... Not Attitude. all that. I think, Shirley, I mean, continuity, there's a strong tradition of continuity. William Hague's in, in Washington today. What will he be discussing? Afghanistan, Iran. Those are the two big issues between us and the Americans. But actually, on both of them, the, the new government and the old government have broadly the same approach, a hopeful approach. Where might there be a change? Well, I think some of the Europeans will look at the new government <clears throat> with a, a, a bit of suspicion for, for because all has not been smooth in, in recent years. Um, but uh, I think myself they will overcome that. It's perfectly clear to me that the new ministers are not picking a quarrel, do not mean to pick a quarrel uh, with, uh, with, the re with the rest of Europe. Of course, it's true that sometimes quarrels are wished upon you. You don't actually want to have them, but you find yourself in them. And um, John Major's government did, do, did find that. But I don't think, they'll be, not, I don't think we'll be picking a fight. Christopher, I mean, you made that s splendidly clear quote about the country needing clarity and vigour and it wouldn't come from a hung parliament a few days before the election. Um, what do you feel about a hung parliament now? Well, now you've had the result that you've of, had yeah. from the elections, you have to think differently. And I think that this coalition, which has emerged after the election, is the best possible outcome given the election result. I would have preferred to have seen, to be perfectly frank, the Tory party with an absolute majority. I think that it was time for that. We didn't get it, it didn't happen. So what we now have is the next best thing. And, that, uh, and I think that not only as far as domestic policy is concerned, but also as far as foreign policy is concerned. Of course, William Hague, I think one of the things he's gonna have to do in the States, which is I think where he is right now, mm -hmm is actually explained to Hillary Clinton and to other Americans what the heck this thing is, a coalition. I've had e emails from friends saying, what, what's going on over there? What's happening? Yeah, yeah. And so he's going to have to explain in a very basic way what it means, and he's well-placed to do that, having been one of the negotiators of the deal with, uh, with, the, with the Lib Dems. 
And I think he has also to explain that some of the stuff in the Lib Dem manifesto, which is a bit loony, to be perfectly frank, is not going to be official British foreign policy. Uh, I mean, Shirley was talking about the Tories making concessions to the Lib Dems, but I think in key areas of foreign policy, the boot has been on the other foot. I don't know whether Douglas would agree with that. And I have to defer to him because he used to be my boss, for Pete's sake. <laughs> no, no, I, d I, d I do agree with that. I think on, on, on the basics of foreign policy, um, some of the uh, more erratic uh, liberal ideas will just be parked. They won't abandon them, but they won't be able to put them into effect. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't think that uh, uh, Shirley is right in supposing there'll be a great uh, rumpus, series of rumpuses about Europe. I don't think so. No, There's nothing on the European agenda at the moment. There's no treaty which is causing huge no. headaches. It, it, it's a relatively quiet time give or take the odd hedge fund re regulation and so on. Uh, so there's no <laughs> reason to tear one's hair or to tear other people to bits. Yeah. So that's, that's an important area. What about America, which you were just talking on and the thought of William Hague being there today and so on. What would you say is the most important nuances that uh, the new government needs to absorb about dealing with America, Christopher? Well, William Hague arrives in America already with significant experience of dealing with Americans when he was leader of the Conservative Party and he was a fairly frequent visitor over there. He understands the United States and, to coin a phrase, speaks American. So he's not going to be starting with a blank sheet of paper. Uh, the other thing, as Douglas has said, is that uh, um, the number one, two, three priority, if you like, is Afghanistan, the place where right now we are most closely enmeshed with the Americans. And one of the things we need to do is to be absolutely clear that we are as one on the final strategic objective and as one on getting uh, from A to B. But uh, Haig arrives in the States with very strong Atlanticist credentials. And I think the symbolism and the fact of making this his first official visit abroad is very, very important. Douglas, do you feel that? I think it is. I think it's a natural thing, given that uh, Afghanistan and Iran are the two prime issues, and they're issues we have alongside the Americans, as, as Christopher says. I think it was a natural thing to do, to do, to do first. He'll be trotting to and fro to Europe on all kinds of occasions in the future. Uh, I think that is right. I think that um, um, uh, there's a phrase which David Cameron used, which I think William Hague has used again today, that our support for the Americans should be solid but not slavish. And, um, it's perfectly clear that that's what most people in this country want. They don't want us to have a, a break with the Americans or to go off into, 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 into something entirely different. Um, they, they value what's called the special relationship, but they, don't, they, they believe that part of being a, a junior partner, which is what we are, is the right to ask questions and insist that they be answered. And they feel, and Christopher's written a book about this, they feel that this was not, has not always been done under, under Blair. Uh, that things were allowed to get through, uh, particularly the, the arrangements in Iraq, were not really questioned. Uh, people ask what Margaret Thatcher would have done. She'd have had a handbag in which there would have been a number of questions, and she'd have produced the, uh, the questions before she committed British troops. That process was not really carried through. Solid but not slavish. Absolutely. Uh, but, Absolutely. But at the other end of the people hearing that in Washington, Will they understand that, or will they say, oh, it sounds as though they're going to be anti-American? No, I don't think they will. I think people like Hillary Clinton and, and Obama and their advisors are perfectly sophisticated enough and sufficiently aware of history to understand that uh, if you're going to pay a price for a so-called special relationship, then your junior partner should be very candid, perhaps more candid in private than, than in public, but should be, should defend the British national interest, which will not always converge with that of the United States, and offer the kind of candid advice that Churchill offered in the Second World War, that Millen offered uh, JFK, that Margaret Thatcher offered uh, Ronald Reagan. And in all those historical cases, I think yeah. you would agree the Americans appreciate, even though there were fisticuffs from time to time and sparks flew out of the relationship, nonetheless, at the end of the day, it was something that was appreciated. And looking back now on the Blair years, close though he was to Clinton, closer maybe even to George W., he did not deploy that kind of candor and attention to detail that Margaret Thatcher would have done, even though she and Reagan looked like a marriage in heaven. 
And what about what about subjects like Israel? I mean, is there any hope that Britain can have any influence in in getting something moving there, some action on Israel and so on, or is that? hopeless it's either the American or it won't happen I don't think it's very hopeful mm. um, I think the America I think Obama is probably gearing himself up slowly as is the way of the administration slowly to producing uh, something more definite in the way of a policy because otherwise they're completely stuck and the whole of the Middle East with it and, and we can help with that we can help as Europeans we can help as Brits um, but I don't I doubt if the actual initiatives will, 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 will come from us thank you both so much for being with us, for plan planning the scenes of the future there for us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Douglas, you. thank you very much indeed. Christopher, in a moment I'll be talking to the ICC Chief Prosecutor on his plans to bring charges against top politicians in Kenya. That's after this incredibly short break. <laughs>